So thankful that we're able to gather today, those of you here in Sanders Hall and in the venue, and uh, also those of you joining us online. Well, after this morning, we have uh, two more weeks to wrap up our study in the book of James. It's been a great study, certainly practical, uh, sometimes encouraging, sometimes convicting, but, but always challenging. Uh, I feel quite certain that just about any uh, Sunday morning as we studied through James, none of us could walk away without realizing there's some work to do, or at least some examination in our lives. You know, if you take the heart, um, the, the word of the Lord, the message through James, and it provides a Holy Spirit opportunity to uh, shine the searchlight of the word into every corner, uh, every dark recess of the mind and heart, and then the work begins. As we hear God's word, then we have to uh, do the work of obedience. So if you haven't already opened your copy of scripture, if you would turn this morning to James chapter 5, we're going to dive in at verse 1 in just a few moments. You know, for all the things that you hear uh, negative about millennials, um, there is one positive note that I discovered this week that might show how unified millennials are. The vast majority of millennials are, are unified around a life goal. A recent study found that over 80% of millennials listed the same primary life goal. Their life goal? Get rich. And you have to wonder if millennials have noticed in, in the last century as each successive generation has become more and more materialistic, they've had to run faster and faster on the hamster wheel of, uh, of uh, capitalism. They've had to sacrifice more and more of their family. They literally have had to sell their soul in order to accumulate, accumulate more and more financially. And yet 80% of millennials care about getting rich above all else. A recent Harvard study, I say recent, it went for 75 years, recently completed Harvard study, studied 724 men. It followed these men for 75 years collecting data to determine what really matters and what brings true fulfillment and happiness in life. Every two years, these men would get a series of questions about various aspects of life that might influence their happiness. 75 years of collecting data, and one of the key objectives was to answer this compelling question. Can money buy happiness? And I don't think any of us would be surprised that of all of that data, this is revealed. Happiness does not result primarily from wealth, extraordinary achievement, or fame. It revolves around good relationships keeping us happier and healthier. And you think about what you know and what you've observed in life. When you, when you look at the lives of the rich and famous, it appears for the most part, money brings a lot more grief and sorrow than it does joy and happiness. But of course, for us as believers, it's not, it's not really about happiness. It's about righteousness. Does our surrender to the Lordship of Christ have an effect on us financially? And, and how do we handle the blessings God has given us? How do we handle those things righteously? Now, knowing, as we've seen the last several weeks, that the book of James is filled with tests that determine the genuineness of our faith, it should be really no surprise that our attitude toward money as believers and how we use money is a key test, and it's a necessary examination for us as believers. Now, if you've already glanced at the passage, you'll notice in the very first verse, uh, you, you've seen the word rich. Now, for you, that may have been kind of a sigh of relief, and you may have thought, well, this is, does not apply to me. <laughs> not so fast. Three quarters of the world's population live in the 50 poorest countries. And their annual per capita income is between $270 and $2,200 a year. That means that a family in the, in the U.S., a family of four, with an annual income of just $35,000 a year is among the 19% of the richest people in the world. It's astounding, isn't it? I know what some of you are thinking, Pastor, here you go meddling again. You just preached about money three weeks ago, or excuse me, three months ago. Did you know that Jesus, if you look at all of his statements, one out of every seven statements was about money? So perhaps I should be more like Jesus and make sure one of every seven messages. 
No, we're preaching about money today because we're walking through the, the book of James, and we don't skip over a text just because it might make some of us uncomfortable. I've told you before, a pastor is called to faithfully preach all of Scripture and then to call himself and his people to accountability uh, and obedience to what the Word of God says. So, so we talk about money because it's a key thing in Scripture. There are 2,350 verses in Scripture about money. I told you before that Jesus talked about money more than heaven and hell combined. Isn't that astounding? You would think the importance of heaven, you would think understanding what's to come, that hell is to come for those who don't receive Christ, you would think that would be important enough, but he talked more about money than heaven and hell combined. Why, Why would he do that? Well, Jesus knew there's a fundamental connection between our spiritual lives and how we think about and how we handle money or materialism or, or wealth. And I would say this morning, if you're not comfortable with the subject of money, it may be that that's because money is your God or your idol. The, the material things you have may be the most important influence in your life. And, and if you're a believer and you feel uneasy when the subject of your money comes up, then you should probably ask the Spirit of God who indwells you to help you diagnose and and correct that problem. You see, for Scripture, it's clear that for the disciple of Christ, what you do with money is a big deal. And our our application, not just about money, but our application and obedience to the Word is pretty telling as to the condition of our heart. Ronald Snyder, who wrote Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger, explained the problem this way. He said, most Christians in the northern hemisphere simply do not believe Jesus' teaching about the deadly danger of possessions. We all know that Jesus warned that possessions are highly dangerous, but we do not believe Jesus. Why does he make that statement? He says, Christians in the United States live in the richest society in the history of the world, surrounded by a billion hungry neighbors, yet we insist on more and more. So the reality today is we're we're rich, we're wealthy. The majority of those that James addressed here in the book of James when it was written to the New Testament church, they probably did not have a higher standard of living than most of us here today. So, So the issue is not about how much they had, but about how they used it. And if you think back to last week, you can see the connection here. Chapter 5 is actually a continuation of what we studied last week. Last week we talked about those, or or James admonished those who arranged their future and made their future plans as if God didn't exist. Even believers, they would would make the plans on what they wanted to do, and then, oh, oh yeah, God. And so they would ask God to, uh, to bless the plans that they had made. Well, this is just a continuation of that. Now he's warning those who plan financially as if God doesn't exist or if it's not important to God what we do with our money. Now, let me make some clarifications before we dive in. First of all, it is not a sin to be rich. I've already said we're all rich. But think about it biblically. Abraham. Abraham had incredible wealth, but he was blessed by God. He walked with God. He was a blessing to all nations. There are other characters in the Old Testament. Job was an incredibly wealthy man. David, as a king, was incredibly wealthy. Josiah was wealthy. In the New Testament, you've got Philemon, who was very wealthy. You've got Lydia um, and and Philippi, who's very wealthy. It's not not a sin to be rich. The Bible doesn't teach that possessing wealth is sinful. Everyone possesses wealth and material goods to varying degrees, but we all have wealth, and we all have been blessed materially. The Bible also does not say that money is evil. 1 Timothy 6.10, Paul instructing Timothy in how to teach in the church said, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So James' concern here, as we look in chapter 5, his concern was not with those who had wealth or had riches, but with those who were selfish with that, those who exploited others to get rich, those who misused their wealth for their own self-indulgent purposes, those who failed to use their wealth to benefit others. And his warning here is to the evil rich. There were in the church some people who were evil or sinful with their riches. But whether that's where we are today or not, I'll assure you there's a word for everyone, and so we want to listen up carefully to what he has to say. James chapter 5, let's read the text, verses 1 through 6. Come now, you rich, 
Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are mothy, and your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You've lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. And let me mention the rich in James' day were, were landowners. You saw that he said that, that the laborers, the wages of the laborers cried out, and, and those who were harvesting cried out. They were wealthy landowners. And in this day, it was a very agrar agrarian culture, and there were many people who worked the land for these landowners. So verse 1, same phrase we saw last week, come now. It's not only a call to attention, but it's a, a disapproval of what is going on. He's expressing disapproval. And, and for him to say, come now, is like saying, hey, listen, stop what you're doing and, and listen up. It's come now, you who are rich. And notice the two words, weep and howl. The word weep is the same word, the same Greek word you see used of Peter when he denied Christ, when he went out and wept. It's an expression of shame or expression of, of, of guilt. It's to be truly sorrowful. It's to, to sob or wail loudly. Weep and then howl is a, is a blood-curdling scream. It's what you would hear, maybe you've heard if you watched a, a news report or something, when there's been a disaster and there's no hope and, and no consolation, that's, that's a howl, it's a, a shriek or a blood-curdling scream. And so James says, we can weep and howl, and the picture is an intense outburst, almost, you would say, violent outburst of despair and uncontrollable grief. So why would James say that those who are rich should, should weep and howl? Well, they would if they could conceive the miseries coming upon them. Weep and howl for the miseries coming upon you. Miseries are, are suffering or distress, and, and the idea behind miseries here is a misery that is never going to be resolved and never going to be removed. It's a misery that is ongoing. Coming upon you, what is he saying by that? Well, these miseries are going to come upon the evil rich at Christ's return. They're going to be judged. They're going to stand before him in judgment. And, and we understand that once judgment is made, those miseries will not be resolved. They will not be removed. It's a judgment for all of time and eternity. You know, Jesus gave a, a brief picture of the judgment coming on the wicked rich in Luke 16. You remember the parable or the story he told of the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man, for all of his earthly life, cared for no one but himself. He lived an indulgent life while Lazarus was right outside his gate and in tremendous need and, and suffering. And Jesus said that when the rich man died, he was in hell. He was in torment. And he asked for even one drop of water to cool his tongue because he was in such agony in the flame. And when he asked for the one drop of water, he was reminded of all the good things he'd enjoyed in his earthly life while Lazarus was in agony. And the rich man's agony would last for all of eternity. You know, if the rich man could have seen what was coming, he might have been weeping and howling. He might have even come to his senses and, and repented. And if you look at Scripture, all through Scripture, and what Scripture teaches about wealth and material possessions, if you study everything that Jesus said about money, you begin to recognize that wealth is not an advantage. If anything, wealth is a spiritual handicap. Those who are wealthy have much greater difficulty coming to Jesus and, and, and walking with Jesus. Near the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus instructed us, Do not, or you cannot serve two masters. He said you'll either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. And who are the two masters that Jesus was referring to? God and money. In Mark chapter 10, you remember Rich Rung Guler came to Jesus and he asked Jesus how he could inherit or how he could receive eternal life. And Jesus, knowing the man's heart and knowing that, that his whole life revolved around his wealth and his material possessions and his riches, Jesus said to that young man, go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. 
And the scripture tells us that the man, the young man, went away sorrowful. Why? Why was he sorrowful? Well, evidently, he wanted a relationship with Jesus. He wanted to be part of the kingdom of God, but he loved his wealth more than he loved God. And he chose his wealth. He wasn't willing to part with his possessions. His trust and his security was in his riches. And following this encounter with this young man, Jesus made clear to the disciples it is impossible to trust in riches and to trust in him to enter the kingdom of God. Well, in verses 2 through 3 here in James chapter 5, he lists the three types of wealth uh, in the ancient world. You had grain or your crops. You had your garments. Those who were wealthy would have many changes of very expensive clothing, different changes for different occasions. And then, of course, you had gold. And in these verses 2 and 3, you also see the first of four sins that will bring severe judgment on the wealthy. The first thing he shows us here is that the wealthy are condemned because of their excessive hoarding. Then he goes on to show us that there's oppressive defrauding, self-indulgent living, corruption of justice. So the first sin that you see here in James 5 uh, of those who have wealth is excessive hoarding. Do you know in the United States today, there are 23.5 million storage units. You see any new storage units going up around where you live? They're all over the place. 23 and a half million storage units, one for every 14 people, 2.8 billion square feet of storage space available for rent with an additional 56 million feet added annually. At the same time, in the last 50 years, the size of our homes has grown as much as 50% while our families have gotten smaller. So put that whole picture together. You have bigger homes and smaller families, but we need more space for stuff. You see, the issue, is, is, again, is not the things we have. The Bible doesn't speak against accumulation, but against vast accumulation focused on solely our comforts and our pleasures. The Bible speaks against hoarding when there's legitimate need around you that could be met by the things you've hoarded. Look in verse 3. He points this out. He says, you have laid up treasure. What does that mean? You, you've heaped up treasure as if your life in the world is going to go on forever. What are you going to do with all that stuff? You remember in Luke 12, the parable of the rich fool, the man who said, you know, um, my barns are full. I've got everything I need and then some. My barns are full. What am I going to do? Because I want to accumulate more stuff. So he decided to build bigger barns. And what happened that very night, his soul was required of him. What does that mean? That very night he stood before God in judgment. He says, you've held your treasure in the last days. Meaning, you've held your treasure until it's too late to repent and to put your wealth to good use. You see, for, for us as believers, the purpose of wealth, the purpose of the blessing God gives us is not to store, but to circulate it for the glory of God and for the, the welfare of man. God didn't make you to be a sponge. God made you to be a funnel. As he gives you blessing. And as we say around here often, we are blessed to what? To be a blessing. Not only individually, but corporately as a church body, God has blessed us in order that we can bless others. And what does he say happens? What happens to the stuff we hang on to? It, it rots. That grain, that stored food rots. It decays. Those garments are moth-eaten. It, it corrodes. It, it loses value. I think the best statement I heard that, that really helps me is that money is like manure. If you pile it up, it stinks. But if you spread it around, it helps things grow. That's not in the Bible, by the way. <laughs> What's he saying? He's saying, look, your, your grain, all this grain you stored up could have fed the, the poor. Your, your garments, that you didn't need all those different garments that could have clothed the needy. Your, your gold could have taken care of some basic necessities for somebody. And what happens to us when we store for our own pleasures? Verse 3, where he talks about corrosion, he says, corrosion will be evidence against us. It's going to be incriminating witness. The corrosion is not just about what happens to the material things that are stored up. It's about what happens to the man who stores those things. Money talks, right? Money talks. So the question you, you and I need to ask is, what will our money say about us? 
when we stand before God. He says it will eat your flesh like a fire. So it's going to corrode and and erode your character. And the corruption of your wealth bears witness to the corruption of your heart. Verse 4. We see the second sin of the evil rich, and that is defrauding, or I would say oppressive defrauding. Here he's speaking to those who gain their wealth illegally or, or illegitimately. In the Old Testament, there were very, very clear laws that required that laborers be paid daily for their labor. A lot of people would come out and work in the fields of these wealthy landowners, and they weren't paid once a week or every two weeks or monthly. They were paid daily. They they had to be paid daily. It was against the law to withhold their wages even till the next morning. Why? Because those day laborers, if they weren't paid, they didn't eat. They literally lived from payday to payday, one day at a time, based on what they were paid. And so what James is talking about here is is those who grow wealthy on on the backs of others. For us today, it would be that if I'm a business owner or an employer, I'm not paying a reasonable wage to those who are helping me increase the bottom line of my business. We keep others from benefiting from our wealth. Remember the, uh, the big financial crisis back in 08? Can you believe that was 15 years ago now? You remember what happened? You had all these corporations, all these failures, and, and the super rich employers and the heads of corporations, while many, many employees were losing their jobs, what were they doing? They were giving themselves big bonuses. It's exactly what James is talking about here. And, and we need to understand, not just financially, but anytime the poor are abused, that gets God's attention. He is deeply concerned about the just treatment of those who are poor and those who are insignificant in our society or our culture today. Verse 4, he says, The cries of the laborers have reached the ears of, and this is a title for God that means a specific thing, have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Now, that should have struck fear in the hearts of those who are oppressing and defrauding the poor. And here's why. The, the Lord of hosts, or your translation may say, the Lord Almighty is the commander of the armies of heaven. So what he's saying is the very armies of heaven are going to come and act in judgment against the wicked rich, those who are exploiting people in order to gain more. Verse 5, you see the third sin. It's self-indulgent living. The word luxury would be a word we would use to describe what the prodigal son did. Just wasteful living, conspicuous consumption, pursuing pleasure. And then self-indulgence is is soft living. Living a, a pampered lifestyle at the expense of others. And notice what James says. Here's the picture when he says that, that you are um, like one, you fatten your hearts in a day of slaughter. He's saying you're, you're like a dumb animal. You are filling and gorging yourself without realizing you're headed to slaughter. Now, he's not saying, I want to say this again clearly, he's not saying it's wrong to enjoy any luxury. He's not saying it's, it's wrong to occasionally be extravagant, maybe in something you do for a loved one. The problem, again, is conspicuous overconsumption, all spent on your personal pleasure. I was thinking this week about some of the i, I got to make an admission here. I, I listen to prosperity preachers sometimes. <laughs> it's sad, but it's, it's funny, too. And I was thinking about how many prosperity preachers I've heard, and, and they love to use this phrase to justify their extravagant lifestyle. They say this, we are children of the king. We should live like it. And I got thinking this week as I thought about that phrase, they're exactly right. We should live like our king lived. He didn't live a life of self-pleasure and extravagance. He lived a life of selflessness and a life of of sacrifice. We should live like our king. Not in self-indulgence and not in luxury. The fourth sin, verse 6, the corruption of justice. they, They were using the judicial system, which is typically under the control of the wealthy, They were using the courts to commit, James said, murder. I don't know if that was actual murder, but basically they were were taking away what little means the poor had. They were taking away what little sustenance they had for life. 
Why is that? Because they were never satisfied. They would do as much as they had, as much as they had already accumulated, as much as they had to take care of their needs, they would do whatever it takes to, to whomever stood in their way of getting more. There's a great example of that in, in 1 Kings 21. A, Ahaz, one of the most wicked kings of Israel, he's the king, he has everything he needs, he has more than he could ever use. And a man named Naboth had a vineyard nearby the, the palace, and he decided he needed Naboth's vineyard to plant a garden for the palace. And he went and asked for the vineyard. And Naboth basically said, no, th this vineyard has been in my family for generations. This vineyard belonged to my father's. It's, it's not for sale. It's not for trade. You can't have it. So Ahab goes back to the palace and does what any good man would do. He pouts. And Jezebel, because Ahab is, is pouting and because she's even more evil than he is, she decides to take care of it. So she goes and has Naboth killed and tells Ahaz, okay, now you can, you can have the vineyard. James's word here is primarily a word against those wealthy landowners, but remember it's a word for the entire church. There, there's something in here um, for, for every believer. And the question for us is, whatever one of those four sins we find ourselves kind of leaning into, how do we avoid those things? How do we make sure that we're, we're honoring God with the blessings he's given? Well, there's a great word in 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is in that same passage where Paul talked to Timothy about the love of money. And in chapter 6 of 2 Timothy, verses 17 through 19, Paul gives this word for Timothy to share with the church. Listen to what he says. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They, speaking of the rich, are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future. Not, not treasure on earth, treasure for the future. Storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so they may be able to take hold of that which is truly life. Now, now here's the bottom line this morning. As we walk through this text, we could look at the text and say, well, I, I haven't taken advantage of others to get ahead. I haven't stolen. I haven't uh, oppressed the poor. There's no problem with how I've acquired what I have. Okay, well, then the question is, what are you doing with what you have? How are you using what God has blessed you with? See, you, you didn't earn it. You didn't acquire it. You didn't accumulate it. God blessed you with it. But, but we live in a world of accumulation. You have? Great. Get more. Hang on to it with everything you've got. Guard it. It's not what the scripture teaches. In God's economy, everything he's given us is to be used for his kingdom. He gives us what we need to have our needs taken care of, and then he gives beyond that, he gives us abundance to use in ministry. And, and we're not to misuse that. We're not to waste that. We're not to hoard that, fail to use it. The, the problem with wealth is it's always going to focus your attention on the things of the world. As you pursue wealth, it's going to cause you to live like the world, to forget God. So here's the challenge, and, and here's the application this morning. It's really very simple. Just like last week, the question was, do you consider God in, in your planning in what you're going to do in life? The question this week is, do you consider God in your financial planning? Do you understand that everything you have belongs to him to use as he will? The wealth, and again, we're all wealthy, we're all rich, those of us who are here. The wealth that we have is a blessing from God, and it's to be used to fulfill his will in meeting needs and advancing the gospel. Would you bow with me this morning here in, in, in the room in Sanders Hall, in the venue online? very simple word this morning, but we can't just say, hey, good word and move on. We need to reflect on that word. 
We need to allow the Spirit who indwells every believer to take that word and take that truth and speak it into our hearts and into our lives. So would you take just a few moments this morning and just, just reflect? Maybe ask if you over-accumulate. You've got too much stuff, stuff that could have been used to help others, to advance the kingdom. You hold on too tightly. You know, when we hold on to material things tightly, we're expressing that we have greater trust and security in our material possessions than we do in God. Maybe you're here this morning. I don't think this would be many who are here, but maybe you've actually defrauded someone or deceived someone to get ahead financially. I think all of us could ask the question, have we, or do we at times, succumb to a self-indulgent lifestyle while people around us do without? This is probably the most scathing rebuke in the book of James. It's over money. We can't simply dismiss what God's word says about money. Jesus spoke about money so much because he knew how we look at, how we view, how we handle money has a direct correlation to our spiritual life and our walk with him. Just a few moments here in Sanders Hall as well as in the venue, we'll have a closing response song that we will sing together. But even now while I'm speaking, even now while we're silently praying, if there's a decision you need to make, there are pastors available to help you. In the back of each room are pastors just standing by, ready to give you godly counsel, ready to pray with you, ready to help you with any decision you might have. They'll be there following the service as well. I'll be down front in this service. If the Lord is speaking... Are you going to respond and obey? What has the Spirit of God said to you this morning? How do you need to respond?